All right, everyone, welcome back to Course of Action. Uh, my guest today is one of the fiction authors that I really look up to, and there's a, kind of a reason why, which we'll get into here in a little bit, but it's Mike Madden. Mike, how are you doing? Uh, doing great, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much for doing this again. Uh, I know I said that offline, uh, but I appreciate you coming on, and uh, we're going to talk a lot of different things today, including uh, your, your first books and how you got into writing and kind of what you're up to today. So uh, again, thank you for coming on. Uh, honestly, it's a real pleasure to be here. I love talking uh, about books, especially with folks like you who love talking about books, right? I mean, what's better? Yeah, yeah. No, me and Don Bentley talked last night and we just kind of got off on a tangent about uh, about books and kind of got off of, uh, I had a bunch of questions prepared and I was like, well, we're just going to flow with this naturally because he was into it and just talking and we were just sharing advice and it was awesome. Oh, that is awesome. You know, I have never met Don Bentley. He uh, came in after me on uh, the um, Tom Clancy uh, series, the Jack Ryan Jr. series. But uh, I had a chance to read um, the arc of his first uh, Matt Drake book, and it absolutely blew me away. I absolutely yeah. loved that book. I endorsed it to the high heavens because it deserved it. Uh, he's just a great writer. I've only corresponded with him. Um, he just has the greatest reputation and I, I love the, the conversations we've had online together. I hope to meet him someday, but that, he's just a sterling fellow. And I just, yeah. I, I'm really, I'm, I just, I'm glad that guys like Don Bentley are out there and, oh, yeah. um, and he yeah. just, and he's on top awesome. of that, he's just a terrific writer. So it's, it's great to see the, you know, yeah, a great guy. Awesome. Yeah. And for him to crush it. And so I'm so happy for him and he just keeps moving up and up and up. So yeah, God bless him. I was at Thriller Fest this year when uh, Brad Thor and Mark Greeny admitted that they had never met each other. Yeah, you had mentioned that on your, I watched your uh, Brad Thor podcast. Absolutely. Not either. I, I met Mark years ago. He actually came through uh, Sevierville and we hung out a little bit and I saw him once or other twice, but that's, a, that's another, Mark's another super nice guy. Yeah. Uh, great reputation and man, what a machine, what a writer. I mean, he just, he's someday when I grow up, I'm going to be like him. <laughs> right yeah i think yeah, i saw something where he said that uh he was in an interview recently and he said that his newest book he's he he went like 170 180 thousand words and was gonna <laughs> sit down to edit and i was looking at my stuff and i'm like <laughs> i'm like i'm not halfway to what he does for a full book like wow it's just amazing both you when you read his books they don't they don't read like you know 500 plus page books they read pretty quick yeah, they read fast. I know. I know. And uh, to have that much talent that you just kind of go over a couple, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 extra words. Yeah. Right? Doesn't it make you mad? Like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Hey, just share that with the rest of us, buddy. Just, you know, I'm stuck <laughs> a couple of chapters here. Just pass a few along. Yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> well, well let's, again, uh... another great guy that deserves everything. He's, he, he's worked hard for everything, but he deserves oh, it yeah. too. He's just a great guy. Absolutely. Well, uh, let's talk about how you got into uh, writing fiction. Uh, your first book, Drone, which is one of my top five of all time. Um, and it just, it blew me away. It, it came in my life. I'll tell you a quick story. It came in my life at a time where when I was in the military, all I was reading was nonfiction and military literature to study for promotion. That's That was what my life was consumed with, that in school. So I had no no room for pleasure reading at all. I was just doing it strictly because I had to. And I ran into your book. I think it was like six or seven months after it came out. I saw it on a bookshelf and I grabbed it and I said, I'm going to read something for me because I got to get a brain break. And Drone just blew me away. And I really, it's one of those books that to this day still reminds me like to never quit when I'm writing fiction. And I'm like, ah, oh, this sucks. I, I just, I think back at like the influence that, drone had over me and mm. i'm not saying that to suck up or anything i'm saying it because no. it seriously hit me like that that uh it was that good so i really want to know like how did you get into writing and come up with that in the, like the first place oh that's yeah what a great question i uh well you just remind me of some just it's so it, writing is always hard I, I know it looks like i mean i'm starting i guess what book number 12 or something right now and i i <laughs> I look at the books on my shelf that I have written and I, I still don't believe it. I have to pinch myself. Number one, I am, I, I am living proof that God has a sense of humor uh, of all the people <laughs> in the world that shouldn't be doing this. It shouldn't be me. Right. Uh, but the fact I look at those, I was like, how did I ever do that? And I remember years ago I read, um, 
uh, something you know, by Hemingway where he said, every time I start a new book, I have to learn how to write all over again. And this is before I ever wrote anything. I said, well, that's just stupid. How can you not know how to write a book? You know, you're, you're Hemingway, you write all these books. But boy, every time I start a new book, I'm like, how did I do that? <laughs> you know, it's really, it, you, you have to, it, it's, you know, the, the Stoics uh, love uh, Sisyphus, right? The, the the Greeks generally see him as a, as a tragic figure who's, you know, cursed to always roll stone, you know, to the top, top of the hill and it comes back down. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, the Stoic philosophers actually saw him as a, as a, as a moral hero, you know, the guy who just works and works and works and doesn't matter if it falls back, doesn't matter. It gets up and does it again. And, you know, it, it's a Sisyphean task. So the fact that you struggle doing it tells me a lot. Number one, it tells me that you're serious about it because if it was easy, then you're not, you're not writing, you're not trying hard enough. Right. Number two, it is a nearly impossible task. I mean, to, to tell a good story is just about a miracle and to tell a great one. And, and again, Don Bentley, Grainy, all these guys who keep cranking out these great stories year after year. I mean, that's a miracle instead of a miracle. To tell one great story once in your life is miraculous, but doing it over and over just tells you how good those guys really are. Mm-hmm. So um, the fact that you struggle, uh, I- I'm laughing because I, sh- I share your pain, brother. I really do. <laughs> and But you, when you said, you know, it, the, that drone did something for you, it's also a reminder, right? I mean... It, it, it's a responsibility. I mean, it's writing is, is a spiritual journey as much as anything. And, and, you know, if this is something you're called to do, then you got to do it and you never know who's going to read your stuff. And the fact that you said that, you know, this kind of keeps you going with what you're doing reminds me, well, I better get going on my next one because maybe some other writer needs to be inspired. Just like I need to be inspired, right? When my tank runs low, I grab a book too to get inspired. So, you know, it's, it, it's sacred work. It really is small s. Um, and the fact that it's a struggle speaks to, you know, how profound and how important it is, both in terms of the labor, but also in terms of, you know, actually, you know, what it means to put a story like that together. So all that say is sorry for the long winded answer. Um, drone, I, you know, my background is in international relations, comparative politics, you know, some war studies and technology and you know, way back in the day, uh, you know, that word you know, early in the Gulf War, right? We kept, we kept, in the, the war on terror, we kept talking about drones. And I thought, why well, someone, you know, I had an idea generally what they were, but I just started to dig into it. And the more I dug into it, the, the more it absolutely just grabbed me by the lapels and shook me up. And, uh, and I thought, man, this, this really is going to change the game. This is going to change warfare, you know, period, full stop. It's going to change everything. Um, because the drone warfare, even early on, was really connected also to developments in artificial intelligence and certainly in computational ability and, you know, the whole range of um, elect- measures for, you know, all the kinds of sensors, radar, optical, the whole nine yards, you know, the whole ISR spectrum stuff. But mm. it's not surprising at all to me that AI is now you know, married and hardwired into the whole drone technology thing. Cause that's kind of where they're going early on, even though they weren't really talking about it. And the whole idea of like, you know, self-piloted airplanes, which was, was the big conversation. But all I'd say is the, the technology absolutely fascinated me. But as I have studied history, most of my adult life, I began to see the contours of how this thing was going to go. So I thought, boy, what a great, you know, fictional place to go to. And then, of course, in my arrogance and my insanity, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll just make stuff up about drones. And what I found out after about 30 seconds was anything I could think up had already been done like 30 years before. I mean, yeah. these engineers that cobbled these things together, I mean, we think of engineers as, you know, guys with pocket protectors who are just doing math problems. But the great engineers are infinitely creative and artistic and unlike me, can do math to match that. <laughs> So they can imagine things and actually build it. That's why I'm in just utter awe of engineers. Um, but they've been doing some crazy things with, with drones for a long, long time. And so what was fun for me on the drone book was I stopped trying to make stuff up and rather said, let me just, you know, take everything that's on the board, you know, on the drawing boards, or I was even able to find some like, you know, patents on Google and stuff. And so what's like, what's the near future stuff? And boy, even as I was doing that, as soon as I'd write the near future stuff, it was already like in the headlines. You know, you, you really can't keep ahead of it. 
uh, and, and this thing has just been galloping ahead ever since. And that's why, I mean, drone technology is still showing up, you know, in what I'm writing now because it has to. I mean, I'm sure you're following what's going on with the Ukraine and Russian war. Mm-hmm. I mean, Ukrainians are dominating the, the, the whole, you know, the battle space. Um, the, uh, in my, uh, not my last, but my first uh, Custer book, I talk about the, you know, the Nagorno Karabakh uh, conflict between Georgia and Armenia, which flares up every now and then anyway. And I think historians are going to say when they look back that that'll be the first war won by drones where the Armenians, excuse me. Um, yeah. The Armenians had always dominated, um, uh, the other side. And, um, for the first time, uh, they lost, they lost badly because, uh, Turkish built drones took them out. The, uh, the Azeris um, just didn't have the military discipline or strategy or organization before, but once they got the Turkish drones, they wiped the, the Georgians off the map. And it's like, oh, okay, well, that's proof of concept. Now, fast forward to this war. Um, you know, we heard about here come the Leopards, you know, here come the Bradleys, here come these, you know, these terrible, you know, modern war fighting machines. Uh, the Russians better watch out and the, they're Lancet drones, you know, these these things that look like something, you know, is built from a parts kit from a model store, you know, run right. with basically a, a lawnmower engine. Uh, by the way, now they're marrying AI, AI technology to those things. So, you know, these loitering munitions, they, they're sitting up there and they are literally looking on their own. They're not even driven by operators anymore. They are seeking on their own uh, the various weapon systems that are pre-programmed into their brain. So they know what a leopard looks like. They know what a Bradley looks like. They know what a T-55 looks like and they go out and hunt for them and they, and they go after them. So uh, everything unfolding on our screens today is kind of stuff that was starting to seize my soul back when I wrote Drone for the first time. So that's what, that's what inspired me to do that piece of fiction work was that technology. And I'm sadly still, still completely obsessed by it. I read something uh, recently that the Air Force said, and they quickly redacted it, was that, um, they had a scenario where they had an operator with a drone and AI was, you know, working with them. And they told AI to go attack this theoretical target uh, yep. and AI did it. <clears throat> and then they said, oh, hold on. You can't do it like that. You got to do it like this. Uh, so then AI learned that the operator is now putting parameters on them getting their mission done. So then it attacked the operator in this scenario. And the operator said, oh, no, you're going to lose points in this game. If you attack me, you can't do that. So then the AI said, well, if I can't attack you, then I'm going to attack your communication systems, your electricity, your water, anything else that will stop you from getting in my way. And then it went and attacked the same exact target the way it wanted to. And the Air Force said it, it came out and then the Air Force quickly was like, no, 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 that actually that actually didn't happen. It's like, OK, well, you're redacting it awful quickly. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the Air Force has redacted things like uh, Roswell with their report to crash <laughs> machine. And oh no, you know, the Air Force is pretty good at redacting. They're they're good at that. Um, I know. I, and the the inexorable logic of this kind of warfare. There, there's a movie that came out, a documentary called uh, Alpha Go that came out several years ago. Uh, it was on Netflix when I saw it. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Mm-hmm. If you haven't, or you're viewers haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Of course, it's dated now. It's almost like watching, you know, the invention of the Model T. But make a long story short, um, the game of Go is probably the, the oldest organized, you know, game that the human beings have played. It's, you know, thousands of years old. And they say, I'm, I'm not a Go expert myself, but they say there are more possible moves in a game of Go than there are known particles in the universe. Wow. So we know that, you know, you can program computers to play chess and, you know, computer chess uh, programs beat humans. Well, it's finite, but everyone knew that a computer could never beat a human at Go because they're not creative. They're not conscious. They can't, you know, do whatever. So the AlphaGo movie is about how, well, guess what? <laughs> AlphaGo beat the first human uh, in, in Go. And of course, that's where it, you know, it gets a wonderful conversation. It's not that humans programmed the computer to play Go. It's that they programmed the computer to teach itself how to play Go. And it taught itself to play Go by playing itself Go over and over and over and over and over a gazillion times and got better and better. 
so that not only did it, did it beat every single human it ever came across after that, it, it, it even beat itself. And so that whole, uh, I think DeepMind was the company that originally developed that. I think Google to hold me that. That whole program has just gone, you know, exponentially further and faster. And um, I think it just, it's the system that has just uh, figured out how to um, fold and unfold um, proteins and DNA, which was another, like one of those problems that can never be solved, but now it's solving it. So the point is, if a computer can, you know, play a game of chess or go and beat any human on the planet, uh, what's a computer going to do on the chessboard of a battlefield uh, or in the air or on the, you know, under the sea? Yeah. There, there's no way that human beings can compute and make decisions as fast as a, uh, as a computer. So what would you rather have, you know, 500 uh, American jets with 500, you know, brilliantly trained pilots Pilots who get sick, who get divorced, who get sad, who uh, get distracted, get afraid, um, have to, you know, have bodily functions, have to eat, yeah. fill in all the blanks, but you got 500 separate minds in a complex battle space versus 500 uh, uh, airplanes controlled by a single, you know, AlphaGo brain. Who's going to win that battle? Yeah. I mean, there's no question. There's just no question. And so all across the space, at every level, tactical to strategic, uh, the, you know, the fastest, best decisions will win the war, period, full stop. And humans can cry and whine and flap their arms and say, oh, no, no, and there's you know, moral hazard here. Well, guess what? Our enemies don't care about moral hazard. Our, our enemies care about winning. <laughs> so uh, th these, these, these battlefields are going to be essentially completely drone driven. And the countries that fail to keep up with the drones are going to lose. And, and sadly, we're seeing that play out right now in the battlefield, you know, in the, in the Ukraine. Yeah, and I think uh, I saw some videos today of uh, some of the kamikaze kind of drones that uh, Ukraine was trying to fight off. Um, and then they were using them. Uh, and Russia was finding a way of jamming them, but it was only jamming them so that they would crash. So it was still crashing into some of their own buildings. Um, which is just incredibly dangerous, but at the same time, it just tells you how um, kind of distance war has become. Um, because, you know, like you said, we're, we're no longer needing to put people behind the stick of an airplane when we can do certain things from afar. We're kind of taking the, almost the danger out of it a little bit. It's a little scary, but at the same time, uh, like you said, uh, if we don't do it, we're going to be so far behind that the next conflict is just absolutely going to wipe us away. Um, be, because of it. And if you look at like China, like, do you think that they have held anything back when they've developed their military over the last decade? You know, not at all. They've, they've no. pushed forward super hard and, uh, but they've played a different kind of warfare. You know, they're buying land here in the United States next to military bases and, and they're controlling our farming and like, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just, they're playing a, a chess on a whole different level. Oh, they're definitely playing 4D chess. There's no question. Um, look what's going on in Africa right now. Uh, essentially, you know, we just had uh, in Niger, you had a, another coup, a military coup. Uh, Burkina Faso had a coup. Um, Mali had a coup. So basically, Francophone Africa no longer exists. I think it was, oh, forgive me, was it Niger or Mali? One of them just said uh, French is no longer an official language of the country. Um, and when you look at the riders in the streets, uh, the rebels, they're flapping, um, Russian flags. Yeah. Um, and, I saw something and about the so, Wagner group going down to Russia. Oh, uh, to Africa. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're in at least 13 countries right now. Yeah. The, the, the Africans are turning to Wagner to, you know, to take over some of their security issues because their governments were failing to do so. Um, and not to say that's a good or bad thing, but the, the reality is the geopolitics is shifting mightily um mm -hmm. the, in terms of the four uh, the 40 st uh, chess stuff i mean africa is a massive source of cobalt uranium rare earth elements um i think france what has what 40 percent of all of its energy now is nuclear power i believe and it's i think it's the most nuclear dependent country in europe and almost all of its uh uranium comes from uh i think niger um, so the Africans are basically going to, are threatening to, you know, cut off uranium and other important, vital, strategically important, uh, minerals and, and whatnot to Europe. And guess who's going to get them? Russia and China. 
So Russia and China have made really strong plays for Africa. Um, there's just a big uh, conference of Africans uh, in Russia because, well, Putin was supposed to go to South Africa, but he was going to possibly be arrested for doing that. So I think they held off on that. Um, but yeah, there's 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 a lot going on right now. And unfortunately, the Ukraine war was the fuse that lit a lot of this. And while we're looking at the military um, aspects of the war, which are important and really the defeat of, of Ukraine is the defeat of NATO. U Ukraine has been heavily armed and heavily trained for almost a decade by NATO. People forget that, right? Since at least 2014, NATO has been plowing tons of resources and training into the Ukraine army. It's the, it was probably the best Western army uh, in Europe and it's been crushed. Um, but that's not the biggest battlefield. The, the problem is when the U S threw sanctions on Russia and Russia didn't collapse, that sent a message to the rest of the world. And so a number of countries are saying, you know, we're sort of tired of U S economic dominance, uh, because, you know, if, if we don't, if we do something the U S doesn't like, then they put sanctions on us you know, right? and they, they punish us economically. So now, uh, you know, the BRICS uh, countries, uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, and China and South Africa, that organization is growing exponentially. Um, and they're, they're looking for an alternative to the U.S. dollar. They're looking for alternative trade. So the whole world order as it's been organized since Bretton Woods in 1945 is changing right before our eyes. Um, so the economic tectonic shifts to me are probably even more important than even the military ones. But if NATO does actually lose this war, and it looks like we're on track to do that, then that's the loss of U.S. The, you know the last straw, right? In U.S. military prestige. Look how we bailed out of Afghanistan. Oh yeah. Look at Iraq. I mean, you know, we we win every battle. You know, since since Vietnam, we've won every battle and lost every war, and we abandon our allies and our friends in the process. So if we don't have military dominance and we don't have economic dominance, what happens to the world order? Well we're watching it right now it's changing rapidly for good or for ill it's changing yeah and i think the uh the rise of china and the investments china has made until their military has really kind of changed the way people viewed the military power throughout the world because it used to be you know everybody looked at the united states and said the ah, biggest military biggest air force biggest navy they're the guys you don't want to pick on and now china has kind of kind of stepped up to that bar and said well, you know, maybe we don't like that anymore. Maybe we want to be number one. And I think that was the biggest threat that we hoped didn't come a reality. And I, but I think it is. It's becoming that reality now. Well, you know, and my question is, how did that happen? Let's see. We decided to you know, bring China into the World Trade Organization, give them most favored nation status. And basically, we've been running annual trade deficits in the hundreds of billions of dollars with them for 30 years. So they take all of the uh, surplus trade and they plow it into, well, things like military development, but also high speed trains, artificial intelligence. I mean, all of their development has basically been funded by our trade deficit with them. Plus, as I've detailed in my drone books and some of my uh, Clancy books, um, you'd be surprised how many Chinese military systems have French and German and American and Israeli components. Mm -hmm. A lot of China's military development is funded in, uh, by U.S. corporations who care more about the almighty dollar than U.S. national interests. And uh, so this whole idea of globalism, this whole idea of let's just you know trade and make money and, and get wealthy together, well, a few, a few companies have profited by that, but as a country, we have suffered by that, right? With the loss of jobs, the Rust Belt, mm -hmm. you name it. You know the story as well as I do, right? The infrastructure, all of it. So we run massive budget deficits. We run massive trade deficits. And who grows at our expense? China. So, you know, the, the people who have been steering our ship for a long time have been organizing, or I should say at least um, aiding and abetting the Chinese development I would say some are probably even encouraging it. Uh, some people in U.S. government don't like the idea of a U.S. hegemony. They want to see shared you know, power. Well, guess what? You got it because China now is a global power and Russia now is reasserting itself as a power. And um, 
I, I don't mean to speak ill of the dead, but um, John McCain's you know statement that Russia is just a gas station with nuclear bombs. It wasn't true then, but today it's especially not true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Russian military systems have smoked Western systems. And uh, that's a wake up call. That's a real wake up call or it better be. So you mentioned uh, the Clancy books that you wrote. What was it like when you got that phone call and they they were interested in you taking over and, and, and offering some Clancy books? Well, there's a long version of that story and a short one. I'll tell the short one. Uh, it's equally as embarrassing, um, but uh, I know we're running out of time here. So the short answer is, I'm sure like you, I mean, who didn't read The Hunt for Red October or yeah. see the movie or something? I mean, Tom Clancy is, is the gold standard mm -hmm. by which all thriller authors are measured. I mean, he I think he basically invented the military techno thriller. He really did. Yeah, I mean, he really he did. did. It's something remarkable. I mean, just that's just a book. Uh, I still don't think the, you know, the, the literary... Um, uh, set in a on the, on the fashionable Upper West Side of Manhattan. Under, really understand how important Hunt for October as a book really is as a piece of literature. Yeah. But make a long story short. So you read that and you say, Oh my gosh, you know, I could never, ever, 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 ever do something like this. So, but when you start writing in the genre and the drone books were in the genre, and uh, you get the phone call, you uh, it was the greatest honor and moment of my literary career that I was asked. You know, at that time, I was asked to write a Tom Clancy novel, right? I mean, what an honor. Mm -hmm. And of course, the moment I hung up the phone, it was the worst day of my life because now I had to write a Clancy novel. <laughs> you know, that's like, you know, if, uh, you know, the King Charles calls you up and say, hey, Mike, you know, would you add a few lines to the St. Crispin's Day speech? <laughs> you know, could you, could you, could it, you know, chap on, you know, uh, Toss another chapter to Shakespeare there, right? I mean, how do you how do you add to the to the corpus of the Tom Clancy you know universe? So, what an honor, what a terror, all at the same time. It was just it was great, and, and of course, like what did I do? But you do it, right? It's a, yeah. you know if you, you, you you're in it to win it, you, you know, play or go home. So it's like okay, let's do this. So off we went. So how did uh, jumping into the Clancy verse, uh, how did it change your writing or did it change it at all or did it change your approach? Or uh, I asked Don Bentley this last night. He had an interesting answer, but uh, curious to see how you went from dr the Drone Brooks uh, and Troy Pierce to Tom Clancy and Jack Ryan. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The when you come into a franchise, and I've had the privilege now of being in two of them, uh, including now the – Clive Cussler Organ Files franchise, which I dearly love. Um, but in both cases, and I'll start with the Clancy one, the great thing about writing for a franchise is you've got these established characters, right? They're just iconic. It's like a John Clark, who's everybody's favorite. Yep. And I, I just, I begged the estate, please let me start a John Clark series. I think that'd be so awesome. And I'd start, oh, yeah. I'd start in Vietnam and go forward. I, I do retro. Um, with you know, quarters in his pocket, or actually nickels in his pocket, and uh, you know, and an old uh, Browning forty-five on his hip, right? And it's not, oh. you know, forget oh. cell phones and forget you know, honey old badgers. Right? Just do old school, man. Just do old school. Um, but anyway, uh, they're great characters, and so basically, it's like they hand you the keys to like FAO Schwartz, right? Like here's the greatest toy story <laughs> in the world. Go in and play all you want, but just don't break anything, right? You can play, just don't break anything. So <laughs> there are rules about, you know, there's some things that some characters just are never going to do. And I don't want them to do them because as a reader, I wouldn't want them to do them. So as a writer, I'm not going to do that. So not that I ever tried to cross boundaries or anything, but, you know, there just is a sense of here are these guardrails. But, hey, you stomp on the accelerator, go as fast as you can. Just don't hit the guardrails. And that's how that was with um, with the Clancy uh, uh, estate, and same also with the the Custer estate. It's you know the the joy of it honestly is um, there are so many great characters, like especially on the in the Clancy franchise. There's I mean sorry the the uh, Custer franchise. There's so many great uh, iconic characters that people know so well and identify with. So I don't have to invent those, right? So what that means is uh, especially now, but also for the Clancy franchise. I invest my energy in my villains, which is a ton of fun. Bad guys are, are the most fun to write and they're the hardest to write. And um, 
the key to writing great villains is to always remember they don't think they're the villains. They think they're the heroes. And so stepping into that mindset of if you think you're <laughs> what you're doing is awesome, you know, what might you do and how, well, how might you move and how might you think? And it completely transforms my writing of those characters. And I hopefully I'm you know, creating you know, villains that people appreciate and can understand. So when you were done with the Clancy series, uh, did you have a plan for writing after that? Or did you know you were going to eventually go into the Custler world or did you have a break? Um, yeah, I had a little bit of a break, and um, the uh, Boyd Morrison was the fellow who was writing the um, Oregon series before I was, and um, so um, I left the Clancy franchise, and Boyd was still writing, but then he wound up moving on, so um, the, the Custler state, especially Dirk Custler, who uh, sort of superintends the editing of the series, uh, of all five series, actually, um invited me to have a conversation we did and we talked a lot and went back and forth and uh, every time I'm, I'm on the phone with Dirk Kessler we, we laugh and he's just he's a funny guy and um he's a he's a he's an excellent writer in his own right but he's also editing five series I don't know how he does it yeah that's great but he's doing a good job he, he's really protecting the the franchise doing a great job of it and the readers love it and love him so yeah, they invited me on, and that was again a, a huge honor and a surprise. Um, the Clancy experience had sort of prepared me for what that would entail, so wasn't quite the panic moment <laughs> that that first uh, Clancy call was, but uh, also its own challenges. I mean, I uh, um, I'm now starting number eighteen in the Oregon series. Um, I started with number sixteen, so I had fifteen books before me by some incredibly great writers. Um, who set the bar so high? Um, it was really hard, you know. If I could just like maybe not knock the goalpost over, if I could just not hit the goalpost, you know, just get the bar <laughs> over the top, I, I'd, be, I'd be happy. So it's been a lot of fun, uh, but it, uh, also a different. It, it's sort of the same general universe, so it's sort of action thriller, but it's more adventure. Tom Clancy's a lot more the Clancy series, a lot more literal. Mm -hmm. You know, and as you know, a lot more technically oriented. And my drone series was a lot more like a Clancy book. Um, I like the technical stuff. It's hard to handle well, but if you can do it well, I think it's interesting and important. The um, in the Clive Cussler world, they're not quite as Clancy esque in that sense of you know super detail on on the equipment. But you know, I everything's grounded in some kind of reality, even if it's near future stuff. Um, but there's a, a bigger adventure element to the Custler world, which is for me new and a lot of fun and, you know, an even greater challenge than the technical stuff. So, well, before I let you go, let's talk about the newest one, uh, fire strike. By the time everybody hears this, it will be out on shelves. Um, you guys sent me an advanced copy. Um, so thank you very much, but, um, let's talk about fire strike. What did, what did the second book in the Oregon file series really mean to you and how did you kind of develop it? Well, that's a good questions. Yeah, how, always, how do you start a new book, right? How do you get a new subject? And I'm always just sort of vacuuming up news. I just have been that way since I was a kid. I, I love current affairs, especially the international stuff. And there's just so much going on in the world. And um, one of the things that was going on as I was trying to come up with ideas was um, the Yemeni Civil War was still going on. And the Yemeni Civil War has been a proxy war. Um, really between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which really means between the United States and Iran. And uh, the Yemenis have suffered horribly. Um, by some measures, it's the greatest humanitarian crisis in the last 30 years. Um, tens of thousands of children starving to death or dying of disease, civilians bombed, you know, crops destroyed. I mean, it's just a nightmare. And so I wanted to find a fictional story that could sort of wrap around, you know, that concept of what's going on there, but also then explore what's going on with Iran, what's going on with Saudi Arabia and the politics of Saudi Arabia. Um, so that's, so it was a, and everything I do is always rooted in reality at some level. And I try to get as close to reality as I can, even though I'm writing fiction. I try to tell, I, I always try to tell the truth in my fiction, no matter what. And right. I try to give as much reality as I can uh, just to, you know, to undergird, you know, the fictional parts I get to play with. So it was really trying to bring attention to that. And in every book, I try to bring attention to things I think that readers might be interested in or maybe not aware of. Um, 
you know, it's, it's why I write. Um, I love, I love to entertain. Um, I, you know, that's what I do. That's my profession. Um, I, I love what Brad Thor said in your interview and I agree with him completely. I mean, when someone lays down their hard earned cash on the barrel head to buy one of my books and more importantly to spend time, precious time when they can be doing something else, um, I want to earn it. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I want to more than earn it. I want them to really get more value for their money than what they paid for it. So putting as much in there as I can, that's, you know, that also teaches them something and, and helps them see the world in a way that maybe they haven't seen before and raise issues that, you know, I think they should think about along with the fact that I just want them to have a really good time reading my books. So, yeah, so that was really one of the issues. And then, you know, this whole issue of hypersonic missiles, um, people just haven't been talking about those and, um, they've been, I actually, my mm -hmm, third drone book, I raised the issue of hypersonic missiles. But again, at that time, they're on the drawing boards. No one really had a successful one at that point. Well, um, really no one had a successful one in quotes until now in the Ukraine war. Um, in fact, when I wrote Firestrike, there still hadn't really been an operational hypersonic missile, but um, the Russian ones I thought might be the best ones. And the Indians actually had a contract, have a contract uh, to, to, to build basically Russian hypersonics. So I thought, okay, there's a, there's a place to look at. And lo and behold, after I start the story, the war kicks off and hey, yeah, these hypersonics actually do what they say they're gonna do. So technology and current events, um, which are real, seized me. And so I forged that into a fictional story that I hope readers will appreciate and enjoy. Oh, and no doubt, no doubt they will. Um, what is your biggest piece of writing advice to uh, authors who are trying to kind of make it in the industry right now? Well, that's a great question. That's a, just a, a, a great question. I mean, there's a whole writer's strike right now uh, that's just married to, of course, now the actors joining them in Hollywood over this whole issue. The industry is changing all the time. And uh, I would say if you're a writer and you know you're a writer, then you've got one job, and that is to write. And uh, a guy named Carl Iglesias, who writes one of the few books I ever recommend on writing, it's called Writing for Emotional Impact. But I actually heard him years ago on a seminar. And he said, you know, you have to learn how to write, but no one can teach you. And that's absolutely true. There's the, there, you can't read enough books that will make you a writer. You only learn to write by writing. And, you know, the, the answer to all of your questions is right. You know, how do you get better? Write. How do I solve this problem? Write it out. Um, if there's a second piece of advice I would have is, um, also from Carl Iglesias, is, you know, are you curious enough? Um, most writers, especially ones who are starting out, uh, don't write because at the end of the day, if you're a writer, first of all, you're a reader, you love books, you love great books, right? You read Hunt for October and you say, I can never do that. <laughs> and you're right. You can't, <laughs> you know, and yeah, and you know, I, I could never write like Tom Clancy and I'm so grateful. I wouldn't have taken the gig if Tom Colgan, the series editor said, I need you to write like Tom Clancy because you can't do it, right? He's an original. Yeah, no. But I can write like me. You know, I, I can write in my own voice. So knowing who you are and knowing your own voice and staying true to your own voice is what you have to do. But that that reader in you says, but I know what great writing looks like and I can't do that. Well, maybe you can, maybe you can't, but if you don't try, we'll never know. Okay, but now you start trying. Okay, this first page isn't the worst thing I ever read, but now I'm on page two and I'm stuck. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm scared. I, I, I am not sure what to do. And so I get... I get a cup of coffee, I'll vacuum the, the house, I'll wash the dog, I'll wash the car, I'll wash the dog again, I'll do anything but write. And so sloth is a besetting sin of writers, old ones and new ones. Um, but what happens is we're just afraid. We're afraid that we don't know how to move forward. And we don't know how to move forward because we don't know how to solve this problem. So we let the fact that we don't know scare us. And anxiety is a natural human response, right? It's a, it's a fear response. When things are going to destroy us, bears charging us, um, which might physically kill us, or this idea that maybe I'm not a writer, and if I write, if I can't solve this problem, I'll fail, and all my, the world will think I'm not a writer, and so I'll, I, I'll be sad. <laughs> so I just don't write. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the wrong, you know, we don't want to curl up. No, we stand up, we sharpen the spear, and we say, Okay, let's ask some questions. What don't I know? What what is this plot problem? What what is the thing I can't figure out here? What's bugging me? Oh, I don't know how the how my hero gets from 
you know, the train station to the hotel. I, I don't, okay, well, why not? What, what has to happen? Well, he has to leave the train station. Well, why can't he leave the train station, right? So in other words, asking questions, just ask, the, the human mind loves questions. We're naturally curious. We're wired for curiosity. So set the fear aside and just start asking questions. Ask every question you can about the problem that's in front of you. And you'll be surprised how the answers start to come. You know, it's and just one question at a time, one question at a time. And then you'll get out of the train station, you'll get out in the street, you'll get from the street, you'll get to the sidewalk, from the sidewalk, and now you're in the hotel. Great. Now you have a whole new set of problems. That just means a whole new set of questions. So you only learn to write by writing. And if you ever have a problem, just ask yourself, am I curious enough? Am I curious enough? And just ask questions. And I promise you'll find the answer. Okay. Well, Mike, uh, where can people go to find out more about you and kind of keep up with you and the Oregon files and what you got going on? Uh, my website is mikemadden.com, spelled ironically just like my name, Madden, like the coach of the shoes, but with one D instead of two. Uh, and that's where you find my social media, links to all my books and where you can buy them and that stuff. Um, and certainly if you're just, you know, if any bookstore that you go to, you can find my stuff. Um, my email is also on there. You know, please, I, I love corresponding with, with readers. So please reach out if you want to. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I hope my you folks will read Firestrike. It's a, it's a fun book. I enjoyed it. I really enjoy writing these books. And so I, I hope that comes across. Well, Mike, thanks again for coming on. I appreciate it. appreciate the books. And I look forward to seeing what else you do with the Oregon Files. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. <laughs>